Uh, good afternoon, coaches. And uh, I, I hope that the, you are enjoying this conference. And then um, I'm so impressed by these many, many coaches are here. You know, it's, I haven't seen this much, you know, uh, the uh, gorgeous type of uh, the coaching conference in Japan yet. Still, it's still yet. We what we were expecting, but you know, it, it haven't. It, it, it hasn't happened yet. So um, first of all, I'd like to um, to thank Sport Singapore and Coach SG to invite me to um, to this kind of a, a commemorable, you know, the first, very first, uh, the conference of the Coach SG, and um, it's, it's, I feel so privileged to be here. And um, I would like to express my great appreciation to Troy and uh, Jaren and other uh, the teams. I'm sure that you know I'm working as the uh, um, vice president of the uh, Asian Coaching uh, Co a Asian uh, Association of Coaching Science, but I've never seen these kind of movements in Asian regions. You are the best teams I, I've ever seen, you know, uh, in this Asian regions. So you are the I'm sure that you are the leaders of the, you know, uh, leading the coaching development in Asia region, I'm sure. Uh, so I, I would like to congratulate uh, your team here. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Um, my talk today is about the Kaizen of coaching culture in Japan. Uh, maybe I need to mention the meaning of the Kaizen, uh, which I sh uh, put on, on the top of this slide. The Kaizen means the practice of continuous improvement. Um, we use this word in many cases in, in, in business, in, in, at school, and in, at home as well. And before going into details, and um, I'd like to introduce uh, our university and myself a little bit. And I'm a professor at the Nippon Sports Science University, which was founded in uh, 1891. Our main campus is in Tokyo, and another campus in Yokohama. Our university consists of four undergraduate uh, faculties and two graduate schools. We have about 6,000 students only for sport. And we make, what makes us uh, special is the achievement in high performance uh, sports. We have sending athletes and coaches and officials to Olympic and Paralympic Games since uh, 1928, which is the Amistad. And there are the numbers of medals here. Uh, here. Uh, we have earned so far. And um, the gymnast here, uh, performing in front of the Mount Fuji, is the uh, gold medalist in Los Angeles Olympic Games, and our current president of the university. And uh, he, his name is uh, Mr. Koji Gushiken. He's a very famous guy in Japan. And we got the first Paralympic medal in Rio in, uh, in, in the uh, 200 meter sprint event. Here, uh, she's now my graduate student, and she's learning how to coach the uh, Paralympic athletes. So it's, 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 um, it's, these are you know uh, the, my, uh, our university's special area. So high performance sports is the our uh, DNA. This slide shows the our Tokyo campus. It's in the middle of the residential area, as you can see here, and we pack the uh, these facilities in a, in a small area. You can see the uh, big arena and uh, training gyms and libraries and, and labs. And also we have the, of course, small rings too. And uh, this is the, the, the picture of the Yokohama campus. We have uh, you know, more space than in, in, we have in, in Tokyo. We have the, uh, the soccer field, uh, you know, baseball field, rugby field, uh, 50 meters uh, swimming pool, diving pools, and tennis courts and, and so on. So. Uh, these are the uh, universities. And I think I, I, I should mention this. I took the, this picture from the website of the Active Singapore, and our university came to Singapore last February to perform Japanese martial arts and traditional performing arts. Some of you might have attended to this event. Our university goes abroad to perform once a year, and our, I, think, I think we'll come back to Singapore uh, in the next February too. So if, you, if you're interested in Japanese culture, please you know, uh, have a look at the, uh, these uh, events. Okay. Um, this is uh, about myself. And I have the biomechanics background. I'm doing the coaching research, but I had a biomechanics background. And especially the muscle mechanics. I teach coaching courses 
at the NSHU, and I'm the conducting research on coaching and, and coach development. I'm the director of the NSSU Coach uh, uh, Center for Coaching Excellence and uh, vice director of the uh, NSSU Coach Developer Academy. I'm working as a coaching developer for another university, and um, um, I'm as working as a coaching consultant for a Japan Sport Association, which is the biggest association uh, for sport in Japan and running the uh, coaching qualification uh, scheme in Japan. So with, the, with this background, I'm gonna, uh, I will talk about these topics today. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the current situation around coaching in Japan, and then introduce coaching model core curriculum we made about a year ago. After that, um, I will talk about our Coach Developer Academy. Then I will show you two cases, uh, local cases, in which my graduate students, uh, coaches, try to change their team cultures. Okay, um, as you know, we are hosting Rugby World Cup in uh, 2019 and Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2020. These must be opportunities for sports sectors in Japan to promote sport participation and higher quality of life through sports. Looking back at the history, we hosted the, uh, the Olympic Games in Tokyo in uh, 1964, which was the first Olympic Games in, held in Asia. We benefited a lot from having the, uh, f f uh, having the last Olympic Games in Tokyo. These are the said to be the legacies from, from Tokyo uh, 1964. And um, at the bottom I, I show, the development of the coaches is, is said to be one of them. We started developing the coaches nationally right after the Olympic Games, which is in 1965. At that time, the coaches were called trainers because we imported the system from Germany. They called them the coaches, uh, uh, trainers. And um, in 1977, we, uh, JASA started to develop authorized sports coaches. And since then, uh, JASA had revised the qualification system twice so far. And currently, they are now uh, revising the system again and I am the member of the revising team. It seems for us to have a kind of a, a tailwind pushing us from the behind to go forward, and we ex expect a lot from, from these events as well, like we had in the past, but uh, at the same time, uh, we are facing major problems or issues which shake the Japanese society, it's its core. Some of you might know this. In 2012, there was a very sad incident in Osaka. A 17-year-old boy killed himself because of corporal punishment from his coach. This boy was experiencing corporal punishment very often. About the half members of his team experienced corporal punishment from his coach or their coach. And uh, this coach was a PE teacher. And also, he was a qualified coach of the Jasser. And uh, we talked about the uh, quality of teaching with the um, uh, weight uh, right now. And uh, you know, I, I, need to def I think we need to define the, what is the quality of teaching level. Because the teacher did the corporal punishment. That leads to the, uh, the boy's death. It's, you know, it's a big problem we had. After this case, various medias and organizations conducted surveys on corporal punishment. This is the result of the public opinion poll run by the major newspaper company. When they asked the question, is corporal punishment acceptable? Surprisingly, about 60% answered yes. Let's have a look at the reasons why they thought yes. These are the reasons. It's effective for sports coaching, 11%. It's effective as educational guidance, 40%. Acceptable if it doesn't cause injury, 29%. Acceptable if there is a mutual trust between coaches and, and athletes, 61%. Uh, Interestingly, they asked this question, I have also 
had received a corporal punishment. 11%. Why not younger kids? You know, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a, a, a strange question, but you know, this, this is the reality we had at that time. Now I'm going to show you a popular Japanese TV program, which was broadcasted nationwide in 2009. It was filmed during the National Junior Tennis Camp. この日、修造さんは優也君に自分と試合をするよう指示しました。しかし、そのプレーは修造さんには勝てるはずがない。負けても絶対に成功しない。このままだったら、この戦い方だったら、この弱さだったら。たとえどんな相手でもとことん勝負にこだわるという強い気持ちを優しい性格のゆうやくんだからこそ、あえて厳しい状況で気づかせようとしました。言
sure, um, the coach in Australia was different in many ways from the Japanese coach. I'm not saying which is better, but I, I personally prefer the way the OG coach took. The very important point is that the uh, Japanese coach probably believes in his coaching. And by the way, some of you noticed that the, um, you know, um, he, 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 he's my, my son. And that's why I, I have this, this, you know, this movie. I was, I was filming this. Okay? And um, yeah. And actually, the motivation, I'm doing the research on coaching. I swapped you know, my research interest from, from biomechanics to, to coaching is this incident. You know, when he was 12 years old, we had a very, very uncomfortable you know, feeling. Then um, is now my son is now uh, 20 years old and playing tennis in the U.S. And here is a photo of my boy. He's playing tennis at the University of Texas at Austin, and the classmate of the first Singaporean uh, Olympic gold medalist, Joseph Schooling. And he's my son. And I asked him to take a picture uh, two days ago. So this is the, the latest picture maybe we have, you know, of the schooling, okay? So, um, yeah, well, let's go back to the main story, you know? I, I, I can't spend more time here on here, yeah, okay? So, um, the, at around the same time, we had the uh, high school boys suicide case. Judo women's national team members accused their coaches of their physical and verbal abuse at the training camp before the London Olympic Games, at the highest, at the highest levels. The head coach and another, some other coaches that at the time resigned, of course. And uh, typically, coaches who use corporal punishment say these kind of reasons. Corporal punishment are effective to develop both sport performance and personality and character. The whip of love. Coaches and even teachers use this phrase a lot. They think if a coach and an athlete trust each other, it isn't a corporal punishment. And I often hear that they will understand when they get o older. They're young, so they, they, they're, they're not, they, they can't understand, but if they got older, they understand the, the, the significance of corporal punishment. That's the reality we had. And um, here, and having these situations, Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, we call it MEXT, or Ministry of Education, and other sport organizations thought that we are in danger of losing integrity of sports. In April 2013, the five major sport organizations jointly declared the elimination of violence in sports. In this declaration, these associations admitted that, deniably, there have been times and situations when violence was tacitly approved. We have to take seriously the fact that coaches have uh, sometimes acted violently in the name of rigorous coaching. Not only just declaring the elimination of violence in sports, but we also thought we needed a new system for developing good coaches. Next, the Minister of Education asked JASA to discuss and formulate coaching model core curriculum. JASA started a two years project to make it. I was invited to join the working team and we discussed what is the issue. Then we decided to start from understanding what is a good player from which we discussed the attributes of good coach we are going to develop. This slide shows the current program we have. In the current system, normally university professors who are experts in each subject area deliver sessions, and coaches have to pass pen and paper test to be qualified. And most of the sessions are for getting sports science knowledge in lecture style. In the model core curriculum we made, we put more emphasis on personal development of coaches than professional knowledge. We are not saying that we don't value professional knowledge. We do need professional knowledge, 
But when we consider the time available for having a face-to-face -face sessions, because you know, the coaches are busy, and we thought we should use that kind of a face-to-face -face type of sessions for personal development of coaches. Another big change we made was the way we deliver sessions. We are going to implement active learning strategy as much as possible. This table shows you a little bit more details of the curriculum. As you can see, uh, we put mindset and learning at the front. We believe this is the core of the core. Without working on this part, we will not be able to change the situation I have mentioned earlier. In the past, the MEXT or JASA tried to change the situation by publishing an order or changing the qualification system, but actually, they could not change the situation. The MEXT or JASA or others might have misunderstood, uh, misunderstood the na nature of issues. We need, we need to consider these issues as adaptive challenges and not as technical problems. Heifetz and Lins, uh, Linsky stated in their book here, the single most common source of leadership failure we've been able to identify is that people, especially those in positions of authority, treat adaptive challenges like technical problems. We need to help coaches to learn new ways of coaching because they are the people with the problem. Yes, of course, sometimes you know, authoritative top-down type of leadership may, may need, but to be effective in, in, in the coach's development, we think we need to learn new ways of tackling the issues. That's why we put a lot of emphasis on understanding learning and coach's mindset. Another point I need to mention is coaching practice. At the bottom, the JASA's current program do, in, it doesn't has, have this part. It, we are going towards the direction of quality insurance. We are going to observe coaches' coaching competences and give feedbacks in order for them to improve their coaching practices. So the ratio of the overall required hours will be quite different from the current program. I suppose that we'll try to put sports science knowledge part in online modules as much as possible, and use face-to-face -face time on personal development with the coach developers. And coaches will be asked to use the skills, this part, for it, um, which uh, they learn in face-to-face in -face sessions in their actual coaching environment and reflect on their practice. This slide shows the time course till the implementation of the model core curriculum into JASA's coach qualification scheme. As you can see here, uh, we have only 10 months before the start of the new system. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm working very hard, but I'm, I'm feeling a, a lot of pressures from, from you know, success. From, from everybody to succeed in, in, in the implementation of this model core curriculum into their scheme. So, but the developing quality coach developers are an urgent matter. And fortunately, um, um, yeah, we want to um, we want to develop better athletes. That's why we are trying to develop better coaches. But as you know. You need to force the coach developers who helps coaches learning. In the new JASA coach development scheme, coach developers play an extremely important role. Unfortunately, we haven't got any coach developer system yet. So, as I said, this is the urgent matter we have. We have to solve this problem, you know, with a, with a growth mindset, um, myself. And fortunately, our university has been running Coach Developer Academy with ICCE for three years in Tokyo. We opened this academy for the international contributions through sports. This is the part of the Japanese government's Tokyo 2020 legacy project, which is called Sports for Tomorrow. This was originally not for domestic Coach Developer development, but in fact, 
our experience in offering learning opportunities for coach developers from all over the world is so useful and transferable to our domestic purpose too. I'm going to briefly introduce our Coach Developer Academy to you now. And as I mentioned, ICCE has been our great partner to run this academy. We use the International Coach Developer Framework as a basis of the academy program. These are the uh, skills which has been said to be you know, uh, the Coach Developer need. And we invite three different types of people, that is from international and national sports federations, like a football association. National coaching organization like Coach SG. And universities. Because, this, because of this diversity in their backgrounds and expertise, and we can learn from each other as a team. And this shows the global distribution of the uh, participants. We had 37 participants from 23 different countries so far. Yeah, you can see we had uh, Troy and Lynette from Singapore, and we, I think you know, we expect much more, you know, uh, much more participants are coming from Singapore too. And this is the learning schedule of the academy last year. The participants were asked to, to do pre-course online modules before coming to Tokyo. There were two separate weeks the participants had to attend residential programs in Tokyo. The first week was in July, and the second week was in February last time. And uh, between these two weeks, the participants were asked to apply what they learned in the first week program in their own working environment. And uh, this was a session schedule for the uh, week one. There were sessions about self-reflection, understanding learning, and uh, problem-based learning, and uh, facilitation skills, and so on. And this is the uh, second week's our program. We start with the participants' interim reports on the learning between July and February. We offered sessions on leadership, mentoring, coach development methods, how to assess and give feedbacks to coaches, and planning of the participants' own learning journey. Actually, we are going to have the first week this year in September. It's, it's a bit different from the last time, but we are going to have the, this, this year's uh, program in September and February. So these are the snapshots uh, from the past residential programs. So we use a lot of um, active learning style uh, sessions. We organize an international symposium on coaching each year. You can find uh, Wade here and John's here. John's again here. And uh, yeah, John's every time, you know, we invite him to, to Japan. And I think you know the uh, uh, Dr. Ralph Pim uh, from the US and uh, Paul Shemp and other, you know, many uh, good scholars are helping us. And, the, uh, and uh, one of the most precious experience at the academy would be learning happening at the guest house, where the participants spend two weeks together. These are the group photos of the delegates. You can find my big brother, Troy. It's a big brother, yeah, namely, <laughs> okay, and Lily, and my little sister, you know, Literally, little, uh, little sister, and uh, uh, Lynette here. Okay, and, uh, and we, now we are developing uh, the Japan way of coach development system based on this academy's experience now. Okay, um, I've been talking about stories on our Japanese cultural issues and possible solutions against those. But tackling cultural issues is not easy because we don't see the reasons clearly why people in a certain group behave in that way. In order to read those, I think we can use the concept claimed by Edgar Schein. He defined the culture as the pattern of shared basic assumptions learned by a group. 
And as that group solves its problems of external adaptation or internal integration, which was worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore to be taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to those problems. Hence, and he also said that we need to think about the three levels of culture on your left side. We can observe a lot of stuff like behavior, buildings, and what you, you wear. Uh, that is the artifacts. That is the first layer. We can hear what you value, what the goal is, that's, that's exposed to beliefs and values. That's the second layer. But we need to carefully read basic, basic, assump, basic underlying assumptions to understand the culture of a team or an organization. In our research lab, using his framework, we are trying to manipulate basic underlying assumptions in a team. Because we think we can change the existing team culture created by chance and working as a break into a driving force towards becoming a better functioning team. This slide shows judo coach's challenge I supervised for last two years in, in our master's degree program. When she first came to me about three years ago, she had a strange feeling with her team. Her athletes competed well in team events, but not in individual events. Then we decided to start from investigating her team's, her athletes' self-efficacy and collective efficacy levels. This is the result. The vertical axis represents the collective efficacy level, which is the, as a group, and uh, the horizontal axis represents self-efficacy level. Each plot represents each athlete. When the number is bigger, you know, if you go up, the collective uh, efficacy, I mean, the, the, uh, the confident uh, uh, level will increase. And um, if, if you go to the, um, the, the right, the, uh, the confident level as, as a person uh, increases. But as you can see from this figure, her athletes were more confident as a team, but feeling less confident as an individual. So we, we confirmed what she, she, uh, she was wondering with this method. We discussed possible reasons for this phenomena and came up with the idea that the coach, which is she, might be a cause. What she did next was filming herself and recording her voice during the judo training sessions. When she saw her own coaching with video, she was surprised by the observed behavior of herself. She realized that she was controlling the behavior of athletes and using a lot of leading questions. On this slide, I showed a typical example of interaction between her and her athlete. She said to me that she was just like a radio, just you know, talking, talking, talking to athletes, and athletes answers only hi, which means yes. So it's not the communication, it's always one way. So she decided to work on her communication skills, especially questioning skills. This is a dialogue with the same athletes a couple of months later. You don't need to read all of this, and it's okay if you can get a sense of uh, the, their interaction. This time, she tried to use a grow model, which is a sequence of questions asking goal, reality, option, and will. As you can notice, when the coach changed her behavior, the behavior of the athlete changed accordingly. She said that she had been trying to change athletes, but changing herself would be much more important and effective. By monitoring herself, she noticed the necessity of changing herself by learning something new. She was in the unconscious incompetence zone when she started working with me. She became aware of what she cannot do. This is the conscious incompetence stage. She tried to change her behavior and became consciously competent. 
She will be, she will be at the conscious, unconscious competence stage if she keeps going. Even if she gets that stage, the next challenge will be waiting for her. Thinking from the higher level of competence, this unconscious competence stage equals unconscious incompetence stage of the next level. She will need deliberate critical reflection on herself to break that wall. So she continued working very hard to become a better coach every day, as the, it says you know, in, your, in, your, in your flyer. And uh, she did one-on-one -on -one interview sessions with athletes. She continued to do a lot of individual talks with athletes. Uh, she used the performance profiling technique to support the goal setting of her athletes. When she had to write her master's thesis, here, she reflected on her two years coaching. And we used a framework proposed by Dr. Wade Gilbert in his latest book, You Have Now, and um, to visualize her purpose of coaching and core values, which guided her action plans. And I'm sure that works. So you, you need to buy, you know, more books. <laughs> okay. So, so, um, so that's one of the uh, one um, example we had. And let me tell you about, about another story uh, of the uh, rugby coach at our university. Not our, but at another university. And he tried to change the team culture as well. At the kickoff meeting of the season, the team set the ideals as, a, as carrying the team. But the coach observed possible be, uh, opposite behaviors a lot during the training sessions. We used the framework proposed by Keegan and Leahy to tackle this problem. The gap between the stated commitment, which they want to be, and actual behaviors existed because there must be competing commitments, which are often not aware of. Keegan and Leahy argue that those competing commitments can be revealed if we think about associated anxiety with the stated commitment. From this analysis, we came up with the uh, big assumption. We wanted to keep, and that they wanted to keep the current status in the hierarchy. When he analyzed the team with this framework, he did the same thing with himself too. He wanted to become a better communicator, but actually he was doing different things. Finally, he came up with the same conclusion. He wanted to keep his current status in the hierarchy. He thought he probably had the implicit assumptions like the head coach should be an absolute being and commanding, and if he lost authority, players didn't follow him. What he did next was amazing, was holding a meeting to expose his own analysis on himself to his players. He declared that he was going to tackle his big assumptions to become a better person he wanted to be. Shortly after, the atmosphere within the team changed drastically. And he noticed many changes in the attitude of players, he said to me. From many cases, including these two examples, we are quite sure that we need to manage our own personal development as coaches. In the Japanese context, sensei, the teacher, or often coaches, usually sits in the higher or the highest position within the hierarchy. It's very hard to say something to your teacher, the old sensei. And uh, people sit in that position, tend to be afraid of losing the power. But as seen in our examples, managing your learning as a coach could be more important than trying to control your athletes. You have the ownership of your own learning, but not the ownership of your athletes' learning. Yes, you are responsible for your athletes' learning, but you cannot control it. Only thing you can control is yourself. If you change yourself, your athlete will change. If your athlete change, our future will change. 
So the coach is a critical agent of creating a better sporting culture and better society. This is true of coach developers. As coach developer myself, I really think I need to learn something new all the time because coaches who come to me always bring unique issues with them, always adaptive issues. They're the source of my learning. Athletes are the source of coaches' learning. To become the best we can be, that's true for coaches and coach developers as well as athletes. We need to create the culture of continuous improvement. That's the culture of Kaizen. These are my team, and thank for your attention. Thank you.